Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? This program that is focused altogether on the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. It is the great and wonderful book that all of us should become better and better acquainted with. I recently heard of someone who was in Europe and and uh, uh, a visitor from the United States talked about a Bible and this visitor or this individual said, wait a minute, only the, only the priests read the Bible, we don't read the Bible. What a pity, what a pity. The Bible isn't just for priests or for preachers, uh, it is for everyone. Everyone should become more and more acquainted with the Bible because it is God's law book to the human race. It was addressed to you and to me, and therefore we ought to make it our business to get more and more acquainted with the Bible. The wonderful thing is that it is also the environment in which God does his saving work. He applies the word of God that we're reading or hearing to the lives of those that he plans to save. And so we have a real big reason to want to be in the Word of God as much as possible. But this, now, before we take our first program, we have another question here from Liberia in Africa. We have many, many listeners in Africa. And this is a, a question that... Uh, uh, relates to a great many people today. Does God work wonders, signs and miracles today? If not, why should we pray? Now you see there are gospels that feature signs and wonders and this is what they're always praying for. Oh Lord, do a miracle. Oh Lord, show me a sign. Uh, they simply are are thinking that that's the real essence of prayer. Now the fact is that God is not doing signs and wonders. He has given us his word and he is actually saving people. Uh, uh, and that is an enormous wonder. Anytime someone becomes saved, it is an enormous miracle because that person was uh, given a brand new resurrected soul and even though we can't see that new soul, uh, that person will know that their change has been made somewhere along the way because they will be finding an intense desire to know more and more from the Bible and to want to be obedient to the Bible. They will find that they're only happy, really happy, when they are doing it, uh, living their life in accordance with the Word of God. But uh, and so far as any other kind of miracles, no. For a little while, Elisha did miracles in the Old Testament. Moses, God used him to uh, work through to bring a few miracles. <coughs> Excuse me. There was the miracle of Daniel being saved from the mouth of the lions when he was thrown into the lion's dead. And uh, then when we get to the New Testament, we find that Jesus did many signs and wonders to prove, to show the fact that he was eternal God. And through this, he also showed us uh, what salvation really was when he healed a sick man or raised a dead man or opened the eyes of the blind. Uh, these were pictures or portraits uh, that had to be understood spiritually before we're saved, we're spiritually dead, we're spiritually blind, we're spiritually ill, tremendously ill, and, and when we become saved, our spiritual eyes are open. We're raised from phys spiritual death to spiritual life, and so on. And so these miracles are recorded in the Bible so that they are assist in teaching us the nature of salvation but the nature of salvation has nothing to do with physical healing 
insofar as being the end product of, of salvation. If it did, it would be a total disaster because everyone eventually dies and normally we die of some kind of an illness and therefore we'd have to say it was an, uh, the fact that I become healed somewhere along the pa in the past uh, was really a total disaster if that is what salvation was. But wonderfully the healing that, go that takes place is a, a greater miracle than ever. It's the healing of our sin sick souls we are laden with sin and we're on our way to eternal damnation and to become saved the means we have been healed of all of our sins we become a new person in Christ we have been uh, taken away from the possibility of that second death eternal damnation now what why, why do we pray why do we pray well, first of all, we pray to praise God. You know, the life of the true believer should be one of praise to him. Secondly, we pray for salvation. Oh, my, there's nothing more important than salvation. We pray that indeed I might be a child of God, indeed that God's mercy might come upon me. We pray for others that they too might have salvation. Uh, and we have a whole world full of people that need prayer for salvation. We pray in our anxiety as we read in Philippians 4, verse 6. Don't be anxious about anything, but w with prayer and supplication, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to the Lord. And uh, in other words, we can talk to the Lord about anything and everything. Uh, because we know that he is ready to hear us. He says, come boldly to the throne of grace. But we don't pray for things that we know full well are not uh, what God is going to do. He's not going to do a miracle. The fact is, it's interesting that in the Bible days, uh, the, the Pharisees and the Jews who were in rebellion against God constantly came to Jesus uh, show us a sign show us a sign they wanted to see miracles and and uh, Christ directed them right into the word of God well thank you uh, Liberia for your questions and shall we go to our first caller on our telephone lines good evening welcome to open forum Hello. good evening Hello. yes yes Yes, good evening. Brother Camping. Yes, go ahead with your call. Would, would you explain to me uh, the four horsemen, please? The four horsemen? Yes, what yes. they stand for? Yes, in Re Revelation chapter 6, it talks about four horsemen. The first horse, a rider on the horse, I... I well, let's, let me turn to that a minute so we'll get it right out from the mouth of God himself because the Bible is from the mouth of God. We read, and I'm reading uh, Revelation 6, verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened uh, one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of four living creatures saying, Come and see. And I saw, behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, actually, these four horsemen have everything to do with the church age. Uh, the first horse on a white, the first rider on a white horse is Christ himself, who is going forth uh, bringing the gospel, and he carries a bow, it is, uh, and shoots arrows into the, into the, uh, uh, hearts of the enemies uh, that is he is in charge altogether of getting uh, people saved uh, this this is a figure that first horseman is a figure uh, or pointing back to uh, Psalm 45 Psalm 45 where it talks about God riding forth prosperously and then we come to the second horseman uh, and the second horseman uh, the second horse was a red horse, and uh, 
uh, it was given to the writer on that to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Now this is, this is Satan riding on that red horse, uh, symbolically speaking. Uh, he is out to frustrate the gospel if he can. It's his goal, continual goal, to try to take peace from the earth. That is, so men will not be reconciled with God and come to peace with him. And he carries this great sword. The sword is the word of God. And he uses that in a wrong fashion, of course, but he uses that to betray, uh, 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 to, uh, to uh, uh, disguise himself, first of all, uh, that he is indeed Satan uh, and that he is the enemy of the gospel. He uses that to trap people into thinking that they can obey what he asks, asks because after all, he's talking about the gospel. He comes as an angel of light. Then the third horseman uh, is on a black horse, and you notice that he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now this is a warning to the local congregations because you see they are going forth with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ but they have opposition from Satan who is endeavoring to stop the gospel in any way that he can and and in time God is warning watch out because if you uh, uh, come under the enticements of Satan the blandishments of Satan if you are not faithful in sending out the gospel as purely as, po as possible, then you're going to find that the gospel begins to, uh, to uh, get less and less. You're not going to be bringing the whole counsel of God. You, uh, it will not be sufficient to save any more. And, uh, and so it is a warning to make sure that as we bring the gospel, we bring the whole gospel. And then finally comes the fourth horse, uh, uh, which was a pale horse, and the, uh, and the, and the, uh, the rider that was riding on uh, it was called Death, and Hell followed him. And uh, power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now, this is the final end of the church age. It starts out with gloriously uh, faithfulness to the word of God as Christ is, is sending out the gospel. Uh, as Satan is in opposition on the second horse and is able to make inroads and able to sow the church with tares uh, that uh, further weaken the gospel. Uh, and then it, gradually the gospel is pinched off. It is not as faithful anymore as the black horse indicates. And finally it is come to an end. It is death. There is no uh, salvation anymore coming from the churches. That is from the ministration of the churches. Christ is not there any longer. The Holy Spirit has abandoned them which is exactly what has happened in our day as we have come to the end of the church age. Okay, Brother Campy. Yes. I've got one more question, and I'm so grateful for your, for your Bible study and everything, and I'm very nervous, but I have a lot of loved ones, and I keep hearing different things about uh, Armageddon. Could you explain that to me, please? Well, yes, Armageddon is spoken about in Revelation 16, I believe it is, and uh, and uh, many many uh, Bible teachers have worked out uh, exotic ideas about what all of this is, but the fact is, it is a figure of speech pointing to Judgment Day when Christ returns on the last day. 
and he's holding trial. The judgment throne is there, and he's holding trial uh, so that anyone who has not been saved will stand for trial, will be found guilty, and will be cast into hell. Now, it's called Armageddon uh, because, uh, and it's, and it's uh, uh, in the context of what it looks like, a final battle, a final battle. Now, you see, throughout the history of the world, and particularly throughout the church age, Satan has been doing battle with Christ. And there has been skirmish after skirmish. And finally, uh, there is a final battle. Like two nations are at war. And they've had uh, encounters with each other from time to time. And, and finally, there's a final battle and one nation wins a decisive victory over the other so that what is left of the of the conquered nation is dead corpses in the in the on the battlefield that's all that is left and and that is the figure that god uses in speaking about judgment day it is not an actual battle it is however a, the final encounter between satan and all of the unsaved of the world and Christ and all those who are unsaved will be found guilty and cast into hell and that's the end there's no more fighting no more battle it's the end mercy is no longer there salvation is no longer there it's the end of the world hey, can I can I say something yeah. so it doesn't uh, like uh, Nations against nation, that doesn't have a thing. That's God's, that's the Lord Jesus and Satan. It's in, it's in valley, isn't it? Yeah, it is Christ who is the judge. He is, of course. Uh, God uh, gives another picture, for example, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Revelation uh, chapter 19. In chapter 19, it's, it's, it's a repeat of the Battle of Armageddon, except it's not given the name uh, uh, Armageddon. Armageddon is actually a Hebrew word, Mount of Megiddo, and it is uh, pointing back to a battle between the Canaanites and, the, and Israel, that Israel won very decisively, that, uh, showing that that was a picture of Judgment Day. And, and God ties the two incidents together. You can read about it in Judges, about chapter 7 or 8 or thereabouts. But in Revelation 19, God uh, uses a, a little different language, again, showing a final battle. We, we read in uh, verse 11 of Revelation 19, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. In other words, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, they followed him, uh, or, and then it goes on. And the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now that again is a picture of judgment day the true believers will be active with christ in in judging uh, it's not a physical or a little literal horse, horse at all the horse stands for power and uh, and victory uh, the white signifies the purity uh, and the holiness of god and uh, the sword protruding out of his mouth is indicating uh, that he's coming with the word of god uh, the, uh, that will find uh, those who stand for judgment guilty because they will be examined in the light of the Word of God and be found out that they have broken the laws of God again and again and again. The, the nation of Israel 
that has nothing to do with the New Jerusalem, does it? It has nothing to do with the nation of the Israel. New they Jerusalem are, is the, Ju- the one that's, it's the true believers, it's, that is the uh, true believers. Are, well, at this time, the true believers will have been raptured because at the time Christ comes on the last day, uh, the first thing that happens is that all the graves are opened. That is, everybody who has ever lived on the face of the earth and died, uh, they will be standing. They will be re- uh, resurrected, both the unsaved and the, and the believers. The believers will be resurrected in a glorified spiritual body. In their soul, they had been living it with Christ in heaven. And then the true believers, their bodies will be caught up. The, un, the true believers that have not died will instantly be changed into a glorified spiritual body and also caught up to be with Christ. And so all the true believers will be with Christ, all the unsaved, both those who think they were saved and actually had not become saved, as well as the most wicked of the world, or uh, and, and everybody else will be standing and to take their turn to appear before the judgment throne of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, good evening. Thank you so much for taking my call. I have two totally separate questions, if I may ask. Uh, the first one is, could you explain about a wife being submissive to her husband, please? Well, yes. You see, God has established government. Uh, the uh, government is on every level of society. We find, for example, that that all mankind have to be subject to God. He is our king, our ruler. We have to be submissive to him. God has established civil government. God indicates we're to be submissive to the civil authorities. If the policeman tells us that we cannot cross the street at that particular place, well, then we have to obey him. There is government within the family. uh, God has established government. He has established the uh, in, in, in the spiritual world is Christ who is the head. In the, uh, in the secular world, it, it, it will be the uh, president or the king or the mayor of the city or, and so on. There are those who head up uh, the government, and that carries through also into the family. The father is named as the head. The wife is to be submissive to him, and of course the children are to be submissive both to the husband and the wife. Now, he's not to rule like a dictator, like a great big boss of some kind. No way. God established rules for him as he ruled. Ephesians chapter 5 indicates that husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, the church being all those who truly become true believers. Now, when did he begin to love us? Not because we were lovable in any way, but because uh, we were sinners and he emptied himself of his glory to save us. So, a proper husband, that is a husband who is obeying the law of God, will also not think of his own comforts and his own toys and his own desires, he's always going to be thinking about what is best for my wife. I I, I am willing to forego this and forego that because I want the best for my wife. And the wife, on the other hand, is to be submissive to him in all things lawful. Now, if he asks her to do something contrary to the law of God, then, of course, she has to obey, just as if we are asked by our government to do something contrary to the law of God, then we would have to disobey, even though we might lose our life for it. And, and, but you see, government, without government, you have anarchy. And that's exactly what happens in countries where people want, everyone wants to do his own thing. So you have civil war and you have anarchy. 
That's the way it is in the spiritual world. Mankind does not want to obey Christ, and so they are in spiritual anarchy. And that's the way families develop, uh, break apart, because the wife says, no way, I'm not going to obey, or be submissive to my husband in any way. I, I, I want, I, I'm just as uh, much uh, in control as he is, and just as smart, and maybe a lot smarter than he is. And so the next thing, you have a divorce. I mean, that happens all the time. And uh, because they are, we are not following the rules that God has laid down. An equal partner to him, and with her gentle, quiet spirit, does that mean she has to, you know, I mean, if, if someone is boisterous and everything, does that mean they have to, have to be quiet or, or well, have no, to? No, no, no. What does it mean but with a gentle, quiet spirit? Well, it means that she has to quietly be obedient. She mm-hmm. is not to say we're, you know, you said we're equal partners. Yeah. That that comes that didn't come from the from the gospel. That okay. came from the world. Okay. Now the the Bible says the two are one flesh. Yeah. You see, this is the the mystery of the marriage union, and this is why uh, people should never, never marry in a hurry. Oh my! I just, uh, you know, I see people that think they've fallen in love and they quickly get married, or maybe they are getting a little older and they're afraid that they won't have another opportunity, mm-hmm. and you just see disaster in front of them. Uh, the fact is that when when you're, someone is contemplating marriage. They have to remember, now, he has his will, I have my will, and we're going to have to mold them together, and uh, and the final decision maker will have to be my husband. And uh, and uh, so uh, this means that uh, I better be really careful who it is that I am marrying, that I can live with that, and uh, that's that's why... Uh, I'm so glad we, in our country, for example, we have such things as as uh, uh, the two people are engaged. They have time to know each other and break the engagement without having any legal uh, do, doing any legal wrongdoing, and uh, so on. I got to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum. Uh, we're talking about this relationship between a husband and a wife. It's very interesting as we go, uh, as we search the Bible. I'm not aware of any place in the Bible where the suggestion is made that uh, the two are equal partners. Uh, the uh, the Bible does not teach that. Now, if we go all the way back to Genesis chapter two, we see Adam was first created. And then God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Uh, And so uh, he says, I will, uh, let's see, how did he put it in verse 18 of Genesis 2? It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. That is proper, someone who is proper for him is someone to help, to assist him. And uh, and uh, that is the role of the wife. Uh, she was taken from a rib of Adam, uh, which indicates that she is uh, 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 she is on, uh, on an equal level with him in the sense of both being fully uh, created in the image of God. There's no difference there at all. Uh, both have a body and a soul. Uh, both are are very important to God, and so on. But on the other hand, uh, God has not abandoned the law or the idea of government within the marriage relationship. In fact, if uh, government has to be there, suppose that your children, if there were no government, your children could say, now wait a minute, when my mother or dad asks them to do this or that, they could say, now, wait a minute. You know, we are equal. We're all humans. We're all created in the image of God, and uh, whether we're young or old, and I don't know whether I want to obey that or not, what you're asking me. Uh, I have to think about that because I have my rights. 
Incidentally, that's exactly what children do who are in rebellion and who are, um, are anarchists in their, in their schools and in their, in their families. Uh, they say, we have our rights. Well, the fact is, they are under the rule of the parents. There has to be government and under the rule of their teachers who are acting on behalf of the parents to assist in the instruction of their children. And so a proper family, you're going to find that the ideal family, and there are some ideal families today where there are true believers. The husband is going to have an enormous concern for his wife, always denying himself in order that she might have uh, have the greatest spiritual blessings possible. Uh, it doesn't mean he's going to give in to her every little whim and uh, every little desire, whatever it might be, but he's going to be thinking out. Uh, he doesn't want to do anything to ever unnecessarily hurt her or, or develop resentment. He's going to be as kind and loving and forgiving as possible. But on the other hand, the wife is going to have an attitude toward her husband. Yes, my husband, maybe she found out later on that he became a drunkard or a some other kind of a bad person. She's still going to love him and and think of, and be praying for him and, and desiring somehow that God might uh, change him. And, and, and in the meanwhile, in every lawful way, she tries to be obedient. That is, unless she, her husband asks her to do unlawful acts. Then she has to disobey, and, and then, uh, of course, she's going to be uh, uh, harmed in some way because of that. And, but God knows all about that also. But thank you for calling. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Kent. Yes. I was very interested in your study that you had on the Bible class of the air about King Darius and the Hazarus and Artaxerxes. Yes. I found it to be very interesting. I got two questions about that. I'll ask the first question, then I'll hang on and ask the second one. Uh, can you tell me, you remember you said that, that, that one of the kings he wrote in the temple on a pillar that he restored the kingdom. I think that was the fourth king, I think. Can you tell me what books did you read to find that? Oh, uh, you know, about um, 40 years ago or 35 years ago, I was doing an enormous amount of work trying to do, uh, understand the calendars of history, and I was also uh, able to... Uh, uh, to uh, I, and uh, once I had developed the calendars of history, then I... I just wanted to uh, look in the secular record as best as I could uh, to uh, see if there was anything that uh, would contradict uh, and show me that somehow I made an error in the Bible. Something just did would not fit together. And so it, I, I became acquainted with a professor at the Pacific School of Religion. I, I went there. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, I had no uh, uh, friends or or anybody I could go to uh, uh, in case I had a question in the Hebrew. And I was reading a passage in Genesis, and it looked to me like the King James translation had made an error in the way it was translated based on the context in which that particular statement was found. It had something to do with Joseph and, and the Pharaoh of his day. So I went to the specific school of religion because they had a Hebrew department and just to ask uh, a, a, a Hebrew professor there uh, to tell me now exactly what it, it, have I correctly understood how the Hebrew should have been translated here and uh, he uh, got my question and he looked at me surprised because I wasn't a preacher or Bible teacher of any consequence at the time I was simply uh, simply a, a businessman I had a construction business 
He says, uh, and he was really surprised. And he, and he says, are you interested in this kind of archaeology, this kind of story, uh, questions? And I said, I'm very interested. So he introduced me to a fellow professor. His name was Professor Jack Finnegan, and again, another uh, man who was uh, 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 teaching there, and a someone who had an enormous interest in archaeology. And he gave me, uh, and we talked together a little bit, and he was uh, so kind to me, beyond measure. He was so kind. He gave me a key to what they call their Palestinian library in the seminary there in the Pacific School of Religion. They had a seminary. Now, this was not a conservative seminary. This was simply a, a uh, it was a prestigious seminary, but uh, their understanding of the gospel was not, not very accurate. But on the other hand, they had a wonderful library they were called the Palestinian Library, in which they had all kinds of archaeological material. And uh, because I told them I was in the construction business and then it was difficult for me uh, to find time uh, to study, he says, well, I'll give you a key. You come in any time, day or night. Spend whatever time you want here and re re learn whatever you can. So I became... Uh, uh, I had access to a lot of archaeological material that later on I, I particularly focused on the uh, Egypt at that time and discovered that Tuthmos the third was the, uh, the pharaoh of the Exodus and and I wrote about that later on in the book Adam Wynn, but I also got some titles of other archaeological books of which I was able to uh, buy a few of these for my own library and so they're they're in my own library and and in perusing these in recent years i i discovered these uh, things that i've written just talked about in connection with the with the uh, 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 uh with the uh um uh, uh, who is the uh the uh, king ruling in the book of esther so it's uh, uh, uh you uh you can't find that in an encyclopedia. Uh, I, at least I haven't been able to find that information, but I, I, I do have a couple of archaeological books that do show that. Uh, my second question is, uh, can you, I know this might be kind of hard since it's been so long, and I do have your book, Adam Wynn, Yes. And I haven't cracked it open yet since I'm still reading Wheat and Tares. Yes. And, uh, but as I was listening to that, I read, you know, the Bible over and over, and I was, I came to the conclusion, too, that Darius and Cyrus are the same, but I didn't know that Ahasuerus and Artaxerxes were, uh, maybe kin to Darius. Could you start from, like, the book of Daniel and just maybe tell which Darius that was, and then in Ezreal, which Cyrus or Darius that was, and in Esther, uh, well, which... I, I, I wouldn't be able to do that right over the air right now. I, I'll make errors because uh, uh, that gets quite detailed, and, and there's a lot of similarities between this Artaxerxes and that Artaxerxes and so on, and it would be unwise for me to just do this off, off the cuff, so to speak. I. That's something like when I write about that, I check and double check and triple check to make sure what is what I've written down is uh, the, there very clearly. Now, you, if you get the book "Time Has an End," uh, "Time Has an End," which is available in the bookstores right now, uh, in many of the bookstores, uh, you'll find that there's a lot of that information in there. Okay, thank you, Brother Kevin. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, this for the campaign? Yes. Oh, thank God. Hi, Brother Kempe. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Yeah, Brother Kempe, uh, well, listen, I've been listening to Family Station about 10 years now, and the other day I was here, you, saw, you was telling somebody about the best way to... To be a believer is to read the Bible and stuff. But I want to know is if you cannot read the Bible and can you still be a believer if you can read and write? 
Well, if you can't read or write, yeah, if you can't read the Bible, then you can, what, you, you can know. listen to the Bible. You know, that's one of the reasons on family radio mm -hmm. we have a program that a uh, half hour of Bible reading again and again, and you know, our announcers mm -hmm. from time to time will will uh, read a verse or two from the Bible. Uh, because the Bible is the most important piece of information we have to declare. So you just listen, 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 and you will be hearing the Bible. In time, we're getting close to that. We're going to make available a, a uh, Bible uh, uh, on, uh, on a CD so that someone can have it and, and can listen it, to it in their own homes uh, w without listening to the radio. And it's whenever that's available, and it'll be one of these times it will become available, we will announce that. And so another question again. I went to a, a two, two ways crusade, but then in the crusade, they were saying I, it, 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 it's a revival. This, the local church will have a revival. But then in the revival, they were selling a handkerchief. For, they said it's some, something for a handkerchief in the Bible about poor, and they were selling it for $10 to people. And I didn't want to buy it because I was like, but then it said it from the Bible that something about poor, about some handkerchief. In well, the Bible? Well, no, it is true that uh, when uh, Paul or Peter, I forget which one, were, uh, were preaching uh, that uh, uh, the people uh, would bring handkerchiefs uh, or uh, trying to uh, get some uh, touch, uh, touch them to Paul or to Peter, uh, but that has nothing to do with anything that's going on today. These evangelists, you know, they're in the business to make as much money as possible. And you, you can, uh, they can tell you they prayed over that handkerchief or they dipped it in holy water or they, whatever they did. And, and I'll tell you, that's just a, a handkerchief. That's all it is. It has no spiritual reality of any kind. That whole business is pagan. It is not in agreement with the Word of God in any way. Now, the, Wonderful thing is, if you can't read or write, you can pray, and God will hear you. Uh, you can beg Him for His mercy, and you can listen to the Word of God as, as much as you possibly can. Uh, we're living in a day when the, when the Bible is available to be heard. We're living in a wonderful day because of modern communication. We uh, can have uh, we can hear the Bible read on radio. We can have it on a CD. We can have it on a cassette player, and so on. There's a lot of ways to hear the Word of God. And Professor Kepi, I want to know one more question, please. <laughs> I just want to know if God, God still talks to you in a dream. If the Lord still comes to you in a dream. The Lord will not come to you in any way except through the Word of God. If you have a, a dream and, and you're dreaming that Christ has come to you, that's just coming out of your own mind. It has nothing to do with it being a message from God. There, you, the, there's only one place, only one place to hear the voice of God, and that is from the Bible. And anybody who claims they've heard the voice of God in a dream or a vision or hearing a voice of some kind, you know that they are n have no understanding of what salvation is. If you can read it right, you just pray to the Lord and He will direct to you. The, the Word of God is the Bible. That's the only way He'll direct you. Thank you, Brother Campaign. Thank God you. bless you. Thank you. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Campbell. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I got a question for you. How it is it that you in uh, Matthew 28, 1, uh, you take a narrative, uh, an account of what happened uh, when the women went to see the body and uh, you uh, switch this for uh, a written commandment? You place a, uh, an account, a narrative, above a explicit commandment. 
Are you talking about the uh, time that Cruci Christ was crucified and put in the grave? No, no, no. In Matthew 28, what he says, uh, after the Sabbath, you use that to do away with the fourth commandment. Oh, oh, well, because I'm, I'm, uh, you know, the role of a Bible teacher is to uh, teach the Bible as accurately as possible. And uh, therefore, a, 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 a Bible teacher should be checking not just the English translation or the Spanish translation, whatever his native language is, but if possible, he ought to be checking the uh, original language that the Bible was written in. And in the New Testament, it was in the Greek language. And if he did so, he would find that in Matthew 28, verse 1, the translators did not do a very good job. They should have translated it in the end of the Sabbaths, plural, as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbaths. And now, that, what, what is God teaching by that? That's what God has said. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath. Those are the words of God uh, as, the Bible, uh, as they were written in the Bible. And now we have to try to understand that. Well, we do know it was Sunday morning. We do know that uh, the seventh-day Sabbath had just passed. And, and we uh, it's talking here about Mary Magdalene and the other Mary coming to the tomb, they're going to anoint the body of Jesus they, the, with, with some uh, spices you know of that? some kind. Yeah. Do and, you know that? Yeah. Do you know that there is two Sabbaths involved here? It's the first yes. day of unleavened bread and the weekly Sabbath. That's what it says after the Sabbath. No, it excuse me. Excuse me. It is the, that Sunday morning is the beginning of a new era of Sabbaths as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbaths. There is the, it's the end of the era of the seventh day Sabbath. That's why it says in the end of the Sabbaths, the Sabbaths have been, the seventh day Sabbath have been followed for 11,000 years. And now it's come to an end of that era. And now, as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbaths, it's a brand new Sabbath that identifies now with Sunday because it is Sunday that this uh, that the, that had come as this is being written, and so it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, God. If we look at this carefully, we can c completely understand it. That it's just. The, the last Sabbath of the Seventh-day Sabbath was that Sabbath when Jesus was lying in the tomb, and, and that was the last Sabbath of, of an era of Sabbath that began with creation when Christ rested on the seventh day from his work, and, uh, and the, the last one was when Christ was resting uh, after he had done the work of salvation. And now there's a new era of Sabbath that began that Sunday morning. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping. I call last month. I call once a month sometimes. Yes. Um, Psalm 70, could you comment on that? Psalm, let's take a look at that. Psalm 70. Psalm 70, there we read in, uh, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and confounded that seek after my soul. Let them be turned backward and put to confusion. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me, I had to cough. Let them be ashamed and confounded that seek after my soul. Let them be turned backward and... My, uh, 
maybe <laughs> maybe the dust is right gone now. <laughs> Let me try it again. Let them be ashamed and confounded that seek after my soul. Let them be turned backward and put to confusion that desire my hurt. Let them be turned back for a reward of their shame that say, Aha, aha. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. And let such as love thy salvation say continually, Let God be magnified. But I am poor and needy. Make haste unto me, O God. Thou art my help and my deliverer. O Lord, make no tarrying. Now, what is your question? Yes, um, in these final tribulation period that we live in, uh, are we supposed to pray, the Lord, come quickly, or are we going to pray that the Lord would tarry, uh, that he wouldn't come back in 2011? Oh, no, we have to pray that the Lord uh, might come back quickly. And that he might, and we're, we're, we're not dictating to the Lord about when he should come. We simply, we know, we know that God has a very precise timeline. He will come back in the fullness of time. And, uh, and uh, we, we only desire, oh Lord, may your perfect will be done. And uh, we're glad for whatever information we've learned as to uh, what your timeline may be. But uh, finally, we know it's all in your control. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, can you explain why, even though the church age has come to an end, that we are still to keep the Sabbath, even though, well, I mean the Sunday Sabbath, even though we aren't to keep water baptism and shadows like that? Well, if you see, uh, the shadows were water baptism and the, uh, and the uh, you know, communion table, but, but Sunday Sabbath is not a shadow. That is not a sign pointing to something. And it is, has nothing to do with the church age or not the church age. It is, uh, it is simply uh, uh, one of the moral laws that God has established uh, uh, now that Christ had uh, risen from the grave. And so it, it, uh, it, uh, go, it is simply our, our command that we continue to obey right up until the last day. Just like we can still obey the command, thou shalt not commit adultery, or thou shalt not steal, or thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Those commands hold true, or uh, they're, they're unrelated to the church. Uh, they're not specifically identified with the church age or with ancient Israel. They're simply laws that have to be obeyed at any time in history. Right. Okay, just since the church age has come to an end, there, I'm finding that out in even in and amongst believers that don't attend church, all these strange doctrines are coming out, and um, it's just hard. And I just wondered, are there any verses that you can point me to that I I could show um, that the Sunday Sabbath is actually a moral law and not a shadow? Well, the Bible, you see, yeah, the seventh day Sabbath clearly says, in uh, in conjunction with that, God clearly says in in uh, Exodus chapter 31, I that you are to keep the seventh day Sabbath. It is a sign that it points to the fact that I, the Lord, sanctify thee. You know, that's a very clear statement that that was a ceremonial law. We don't find that in connection with the Sunday Sabbath. The Sunday Sabbath is spoken about in various places, uh, it, uh, uh, but the dominant place is Isaiah 58, where the whole chapter is dealing with how we are to conduct ourselves throughout the New Testament era. And, and uh, it's not identified with the church age particularly. It's just identified with the whole New Testament era. And, and then in that connection, he says in verse 13, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, 
the holy of the Lord honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, but finding nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. Now that's a very plain statement that our the Sunday Sabbath is for the purpose of focusing our attention altogether on our relationship with Christ. And that uh, during the church age, the church age was, the churches were a help in this. Now that we're not in the church age, we we are even more helped because we work more directly with the Bible and uh, and uh, are more and more conscious of the importance of the Bible. But hold on, I'll, uh, we, I'll be right back with you. We're discussing uh, the uh, these two Sabbaths, the seventh day Sabbath that God had commanded all the way from creation until uh, uh, till uh, Christ arose from the grave, uh, as compared with the first day Sabbath. Now, uh, the, during the eleven thousand years from creation until the time of Christ, uh, there was no need for a first day Sabbath because already uh, there, God had carved out of the week a day called the seventh day Sabbath in which there was not to be any physical labor done of any kind uh, the idea being to focus the attention of the one not doing any work on the seventh day Sabbath on the fact that they were not to do any work in order to become saved that is their salvation had to be accomplished entirely by the work of Christ. And so it, its very nature tended to give the, uh, the uh, Israelites of the Old Testament one day out of seven, which was uh, very spiritual in nature. They, they, it was a day when they were to focus on uh, on uh, what salvation really was and how they could become saved or how God had to do all the work to save them and it was not muddied by the fact that uh, they also were trying to spend their time painting their house or mowing their lawn or fixing their automobile and so on of course they didn't have those things then but you get the idea but then, you know, when God finished with the seventh-day Sabbath, because that was a sign, a shadow, it was, and it was fulfilled in Christ that he did all the work to save us, now where are we? Mankind still is a spiritual being, and this world is very oppressive insofar as the making its demands on making a living and, and uh, making our way in this world. And so in order to ensure that mankind would still have one spiritual day, God introduced the first day Sabbath. Uh, right there in Matthew 28, verse 1, and he, did, he, he alludes to it uh, in also in, in uh, other chapters of the Bible, of the New Testament, uh, and, and uh, so that we would still have a day, not identified with the seventh day Sabbath, not as a sign of some kind, pointing to the fact that we're not to work for our salvation, but as a moral day that, that we have no obligation to work. We can now freely spend the whole time in sharing the gospel with others and in prayer and in Bible study and Bible reading and so on. Mankind needs that because we were created as a spiritual being and uh, and yet the conduct of the world is such that it militates and mitigates against uh, against the the fact that we are a spiritual being it uh, it uh, we become so secular and involved with the cares of this world we don't find time to really focus on Christ and so God deliberately set up a day the, the new era of Sabbath began to dawn that Sunday morning after the seventh day Sabbath era had come to a close so that mankind would have a day where he uh, had no obligation to work and his answering to God 
for the care of his family and for uh, anything else. Uh, this day was no, no work today. We're today we're going to focus on our relationship with Christ. We need this in order to maintain a, to help us in our in our spiritual growth. But Would thanks. you say that Rome? Can I just refer to one more verse? Yes. Um, Romans 14:5. Would you say that that, that means we still um, keep the Sunday Sabbath, but if we can um, worship and glorify God on more days, on all seven days, then even better. Like it, it doesn't mean that we can choose Wednesday if we want. Or that, excuse me, that's not the intent of Romans 14. Uh, Romans 14 is a longer statement. Then Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Uh, the, uh, the, there was an enormous difficulty in transitioning from the church age, or excuse me, from the age of, of national Israel when God had used them as their, his chosen people and they met in the temple and they had all the ceremonial laws that went with it, the laws concerning meat and drink and so on and to transition to the church age was an enormous wrench or just an enormous transition and so God wrote extensively about with that in mind in Romans 14 and and in shorthand so to speak in Colossians 2 he says let no man judge you concerning uh, uh, meat or drink or or, or uh, uh, feast days or new moons or Sabbaths which are a shadow of things to come. That's really a summary of everything that Romans 14 teaches. But God is not teaching anywhere that, you know, uh, uh, as long as you just keep a day someplace along the line, uh, holy, you'll achieve what I'm uh, driving at. The Bible talks about a Sabbath day, and in Matthew 28, verse 1, and in Luke 24, verse 1, and elsewhere, He's pegged what day that is. It's the first day of the week. And then he also demonstrated uh, how we are to observe that day. For example, when Christ began the work of creation, the very first day was Sunday. And what did he say? Let there be light. And light has to do with the gospel. Already he was... Uh, giving us a picture of the fact on the first day we are to be concerned about getting the gospel out into the world. Then, when Christ arose from the grave, it was not accidental that he arose on Sunday morning. Uh, and he is the first fruits. He, because he arose, therefore, uh, people can become saved. That is, we arise uh, from spiritual death. And that's identified with that Sunday morning when Christ arose. And then really to lock it in when he poured out the Holy Spirit and began the New Testament church age. Uh, it was at, on Pentecost, as we read about it in Acts 2. That was a Sunday, Sunday, uh, that uh, that occurred. And uh, it was on that day about 3,000 were saved. And so God has really uh, focused on that first day of the week. And those who claim, well, you know, I serve the Lord any old day or uh, several days of the week. Yeah, we can do that, but that is not negating the fact Sunday is the Lord's day. That is the Lord's day that we want to make sure that on that day we're focusing our attention on Christ's things and not on this world. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Campion, how are you? Very well, thank you. Great, Brother Campion. I just wanted to um, thank you. Hold on, let me lower my radio. Thank you for um, for creating Family Radio, Brother Campion. Um, I passed the, the channel 66 at WFME, yes. my station where I live. And I noticed you on that chair there, and I said, "What this? Uh, let me see what this old fool has to say." And um, I just thank God so much that I, I did that. 
I've been uh, something's been happening with me that um, I turn on the radio and something's bothering me, and boom, someone calls and it answers my my concern or my prayer. And this radio station has been such a blessing to me, Brother Campion. It's brought me to God. Well, you know, the fact is that it's not because of what I have done or whatever. No, it's, it's definitely it's what God. God has done. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And, and the blessing comes because we talk about the Bible. It is the Bible that gives us the answers, and sometimes we uh, are, are, are uh, beside ourselves with concerns and worries and so on, and and uh, and yet as we talk about the message of the Bible, there's something that's going to come through that is exactly what you need right at that point, and that that of course is is the way the Bible is. I wanted to, because a caller just previously called a little while ago with regards to um, Psalm 7. In the past few days, I've been talking about forgiveness. And I've been resisting so much this thing about forgiveness in my heart. And I pray to God to help me uh, to search my heart, to, to, to help me, to give me the power to, to, to do His will. And 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 to for and I and I do and I and I have and then I come and then it hits me again then something else hits me and some other thing if it isn't a sexual lust or or then some other angry thing and I notice that even uh, uh, it just happens it's one thing after another and I pray and it goes away and just and, and yesterday last night again I've uh, came across people that. My God, I mean, it, it, just, it just stirred such anger in me. And and I'm saying, why is this happening to me? I really have not, I don't deserve this. I have not done this to these people. I. Uh, what is the problem here? What is going on? Why do I feel these extreme emotions that to want to uh, to be rageful? And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I knew that I'm sinning. I knew that I was sinning. And I, I, I knelt and I prayed. And it went away. And then I pray for God's peace. Well, that's the wonder of prayer. You see, we pour our hearts out to the Lord and leave it there. And God, uh, God gives us assurance in our soul. And and uh, I'll tell you, to walk with God, that's the that's the name of the game. That's the name of everything. Just walking with Him, and we walk with Him as we as we uh, ponder the Bible, as we meditate on what we read in the Bible, as we pray and, and, and confess our sins to God and, and, and plead with Him for strength to do it God's way and so on. And there's no other way to live. Uh, you, uh, do it God's way and things begin to, to uh, be different in our life without any question. But it doesn't mean that we're at the end of uh, troubles and trials, but it no, means I, I, that when I, the trouble and the trial comes, we have learned to be more and more dependent upon the Lord Jesus, to lean back on His almighty arms. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. Yes, hi, good night. I'm calling. I was listening to your comment about Christ coming in um, 2011, and I'd like to know how you knew that. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's a product of just a whole lot of information in the Bible. I've written a book called Time as an, as an End. That uh, It's about a 500-page book that is uh, available at your bookstore. Uh, and uh, at, at least some of the major bookstores, and uh, you might try to buy a copy. It's only 12.95. We kept the price as low as possible, but the bookstore has to make a profit, and the and the uh, uh, the uh, every the wholesalers and the printer and everybody else have to make a profit. So Family Radio doesn't make anything, but. 
but uh, we do want to, we did want to have it available out there in the marketplace. And I would suggest that you try to get a copy. And uh, and uh, there's just an enormous amount of information there of things that. God now is showing us that have been mysteries heretofore in the Bible. And these mysteries now, we're living in a day when God is revealing them through His Word. And that's the nature of this book time as an end to, to, to discuss many of these things. Okay. So what if He doesn't come in 2011? Well, you know... I, I, if he doesn't come in 2011, it means that somehow we haven't read the Bible correctly. Uh, I have to admit that this is a subject that I have studied and studied and studied and studied and continue to study, and I, I don't find any alternative times. I, I, don't, I would never be so bold as to say it's absolutely certain that he is coming in the year 2011 because the Bible doesn't make a clear statement like that but the but the evidence is very very great that focuses on the year 2011 uh, the biblical pattern of the way God has unfolded history fits everything fits in place and so I w I guess I'll have to say I would be quite surprised if it didn't happen but thank okay. you, thank you, thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening, welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Captain. Yes. Um, Jeremiah 23, verse 4. Uh, 43? No, 20, 23, verse 4. Okay, Jeremiah 23, verse 4. Let's look at that. 23, verse 4. Let's start with verse 3. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Now, what is your question? In verse 4, shepherds. Who are shepherds, and then is there any identical language to these verses in the New Testament that would parallel this passage? Well, no. You see, actually, every one of us is who is a true believer is a shepherd. We, uh, we, we uh, are concerned for the sheep, and the sheep are anyone who needs the gospel. And, and it's talking here about faithful shepherds. And true believers will be faithful shepherds. Now, during the church age, particularly, God was focusing on the pastors and the elders and the deacons. And, uh, and unfortunately, increasingly, they were less and less faithful uh, ordinarily. And, uh, and, uh, so fine, and so God has a lot of negative things to say about that about what what kind of shepherds they were but now he's talking about the the latter rain he's talking about the second jubilee that began a few years ago when the uh, as god again is saving people all over the world the family radio for example is shepherding in that we are teaching uh, and guiding people into the word of god encouraging them in the word of god those who become true believers in turn a witness to a friend or a loved one uh, encouraging them in the word of God so they again are attempting to be faithful shepherds can I ask you one more question please yes Hebrews chapter 6 Hebrews chapter 6 yeah I heard this on your um, Bible study somewhere on the program I don't remember exactly how you explained it, but could you please explain it again? Verses well, 40, 46, yes. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. 1 through 3. Yeah. Okay, let's look at that. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, and it goes on there. Let us go on unto perfection. 
not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. And then verse 2, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. These two verses will be fine. Yeah, well, but you see, you can't separate these three verses from what follows, because notice the, the, the verse 4 begins, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. In other words, that word for, that introduces verse 4 of, uh, of Hebrews 6, ties it back to the three verses. Now, the, what God is indicating here, that we have to, it's one thing to teach certain doctrines and churches. Each church has a creed. Every church. There are churches who say, no creed but Christ. Well, they do have a creed because if you ask them, uh, uh, tell me how you think it will be when Christ returns. Uh, is there going to be a thousand year reign of Christ? And they will have a, an opinion about that. That is their creed. Uh, tell me, what, uh, how do we become saved? And they will tell you how they think you can become saved. And that becomes a creed. Every church has its creeds. And, uh, but God is saying we have to go on unto perfection. Uh, uh, notice he, he really is emphasizing uh, the idea of baptism and of uh, uh, laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment and uh, that, uh, those are all very important subjects but we have to go on and keep studying and keep studying and this is focusing on our day because remember in the twelfth chapter of Daniel God had said uh, to Daniel as he presented him a lot of information concerning the end of the world he said seal up the book Daniel seal it up it is for the time of the end and uh, and uh, the role of a of a true believer uh, is to want to understand as much as possible from the Word of God. Now, what has ha happened is that uh, that uh, God came to an end with the local congregations because they were not going on. They had established hermeneutics, for example, that prohibited them from understanding great portions of the Bible. Uh, the, I, I'm not aware of a, of a local congregation that has a true understanding of how to interpret the Bible. Uh, the a true interpreter interpretation of the Bible requires that we thoroughly understand the biblical principle that Christ spoke in parables and that he is totally identified with the whole Bible. He is the Word of God. Therefore, we should expect throughout the Bible uh, a, a, the gospel to shine through. And uh, those statements that, uh, in, as they stand, do not apparently uh, deal directly with the gospel, we are to understand that they are parables. Christ did, always spoke in parables. Now, that principle has has been lost on the local congregation so they uh, and there are great portions of the bible like jeremiah and isaiah and hosea and parts of uh, matthew and revelation and so on that uh, we can only understand if we understand the principle that christ spoke in parables and so therefore because there has been no movement uh, from the creeds that had already uh, that the churches have uh, they stand uh, with those creeds and will not go beyond that uh, therefore in, in their continuing to understand more and more of the Bible God is saying now we have to go on to perfection and what has happened is that God has a judgment has brought judgment on the local congregation so that what follows in verse 4 and 5 uh, takes place. It is impossible to uh, for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the prom promise of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God. 
you see what has happened is is that the Holy Spirit has abandoned the local congregations and so even though uh, that throughout the church age that church has been blessed in many ways the Holy Spirit has been active there and they have had people become saved there and so on now it is uh, when somebody is unsaved they cannot become saved in that local congregation because uh, the church has not gone on to perfection it hasn't continued to develop the Word of God and try to understand more and more of it it has stuck with what they uh, first learned the creeds that they had and and many of the things in those creeds were quite accurate but they were only a very tiny part of the whole Bible and the role of the church was to bring the whole counsel of God and they're unable to do that because they have never continued their study of the whole Word of God. So, Mr. Kampanen, uh, you've talked to, I'm sure, many church leaders, and in Jeremiah 7, verse 16, it says, Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. What kind of response would they give on this from um, from what you heard, uh, what, what kinds of things would they say about this verse here? Have you heard anything? Well, I, I can't speak for them, but because they don't understand this as, uh, as uh, focusing on the local time of the local congregations, they will simply say, well, that was the situation in Israel at that day. Uh, Israel had become so obstinate and de decadent spiritually that God had withdrawn from them and they'll only look at it in the light of history as ancient Israel they will not see that this is a historical parable that God is using what happened in Judah to focus on what he is presently what he is presently doing uh, to the local congregations and uh, they just will not be able to understand it they, because they have they have been thoroughly indoctrinated to use a hermeneutic that will that is a method of Bible interpretation that will not permit them to see the spiritual reality of those kinds of statements. But, those who are co conference actors also, those who are teaching there, and they're doing a fine job. Thanks to God, and thank you very much, Mr. Campen. Thank you for calling and sharing. We've come to the end of our time. Uh, Lord willing, we will be back together again tomorrow evening. Now, in the meanwhile, don't stop reading the Bible. Don't stop pondering the Bible. And and uh, you just keep reading. If the first uh, 19 verses you read, there was no, you didn't understand, keep reading. Then you'll find one that is particularly relevant. And then you want to spend time with that again. And again, until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.